Hello, athletes and coaches. Thanks for joining me and watching this video. A little bit about myself before we dive into the program. My name is Coach Kyle. I'm the founder and head coach at Sattva Center for Archery Training in Massachusetts. I love movement. I love the pursuit of higher performance. I love learning and I gravitate towards challenges. I'm proud to say that I started my coaching career 28 years ago and I have not stopped since. I've trained on how to be a better coach and a better athlete with coaches from the US, Canadian, New Zealand, and Austrian ski teams, the US snowboard demonstration team members, uh, former US Olympic canoeists, and nationally known rock climbing guides as well. Archery is one of five sports I've been certified to coach at a national level. And this means I've had the unique experience of applying skills that, such as instructional design, training activity development, and movement analysis in a variety of settings. I've taught physical education at the elementary school level, trained coaches in my role as a high school athletic director, and coached and taught at the collegiate level. Tonight, we explore the topic of training activities. I will share what training activities need to include in order to optimize your motor learning and ability to perform under pressure. I encourage you to draw a little um, parking lot on your piece of note paper. Go get a new piece of note paper if you don't have one already and write any questions you have down that come up for you during this presentation. Write them in that parking lot and email them to me at the end of this presentation. So let's look, a, let's look at the flow of what we'll be doing this evening. The image, uh, these blue bubbles here, I'll start with the blue bubble at 12 o'clock. And first, what we'll do tonight is define what motor learning and mental processes are before exploring the six essential elements included in effective training activities. You will walk away from this presentation with access to 22 mostly new training activities. We will only look deeply at a few of the activities during this presentation uh, because my intent is to have you walk away tonight understanding why training activities are valuable and what the hallmarks of good training activities are. So it's important for you to understand the why and the what because that understanding will transform you from someone who might be a passenger during a training activity, mindlessly going through the motions, to an invested crew member with clear role of being attentive and focused on specific elements of form and process. Now, I also want you to walk away tonight with a recipe and inspiration for creating your own training activities. I want you to be a master of your, your own archery world. Children, young children in particular, are masters of their world when it comes to play and imagination. The young children literally design their own training activities and adapt the rules of the game or environment or other criteria until there is balance between challenge, success, and failure. I vividly recall doing this as a young boy with a variety of topics. The benefit of being a master of your own world is that you always feel like a superhero and that is good for self-image. Self-image is good for performance. Let's see, I have several prompts that I will present to you tonight, and those prompts are designed to uh, act as reflection questions. I will give you, I want you to pause the video when we get to those prompts and go ahead and take maybe 60 seconds with your video uh, paused and answer the questions that I provide to you. Those answers you don't need to send to me, they're really to help you bridge, um, uh, bridge the learning from what you're watching to what you're understanding and what you'll eventually apply with your own practice. So grab a pen, make sure you have some paper and let's get started. So let's define training activities. First of all, training activities are planned events designed to challenge and improve physical, mental and tactical skills needed to progress as an archer. Broadly speaking, training activities can be a progression or a standalone activity, they can be individually based or cooperative, competitive, or more exploratory. Training activities must inform your motor learning and mental processes. If the training activity interrupts your motor learning and mental processes, then they are a waste of time. If you write one note on your paper tonight, let it be the concept of informing motor learning, right? Training activities must 
inform your motor, motor learning, not interrupt it. Let's define motor learning and mental process since those are two terms that are in the definition here for training activities. Motor performance refer, refers to short term gains in your ability to perform a movement. You learn a new skill on Monday at 5 p.m. and you can perform that skill relatively well by Monday 7 p.m. But does it stick? How many times have you had your coach work with you on skill development? You find relatively quick success and then you cannot repeat that performance a week later. Well, you experienced a temporary increase in skill, aka motor performance, and it did not reach the stage of motor learning. Motor learning is the ultimate goal in motor development because it is longer term. The skills stick over time. Motor learning exists once you can consistently repeat desirable movement patterns, positions, or power outputs without prompting. When you experience motor learning, the skills stick over time. Motor learning is, the, is an ideal outcome of engaging in a training activity. After all, who would choose to invest the time in a training activity if the benefits only last a few days? We want the benefits to stick over time. Simply doing a training activity does not mean you will experience motor learning. You must have attention, receive feedback, and reflect on the process in transformative ways. Now we'll come back to feedback and reflection later when we color, cover elements of effective training activities. To bring the definition of training activities back to the forefront of your mind, planned events designed to inform motor learning and mental processes. We just learned that motor learning is essentially skill retention over time, skills that stick. We want training activities to also inform our mental processes. Let's look at some mental processes. Well, the eight mental steps of the shot cycle are mental processes set set up, load, anchor, transfer, and expand, follow through. If effective training activities likely link back to cues or goals related to one of these steps. A training activity could ha have the superficial goal of getting an arrow in every single ring on the target, as in shoot the rainbow, but there needs to be a primary goal focused on something that's process oriented. Components of software are also mental processes. Once you're familiar with software and NTS, it feels impossible to separate that, separate out the software and the hardware. For clarity, software components include attention and focus, intensity control, breathing, rhythm and timing, and balance of conscious, subconscious, and self-image. Training activities that focused on software will strengthen your mental process, and a strong, familiar mental process is easier to fall back, back on when the going gets tough. Let's talk about growth mindset, all right? Your disposition in a, any given moment. So specifically, let's consider our attitude or mindset that you might have when you engage in a training activity. You will literally get out of a training activity at benefit more from training activities they engage in when they engage with a growth mindset, when they believe they can get better, when they are actively seeking to inform their motor development and mental processes. This could also be called deep practice. I could talk a lot about deep practice, but for this presentation, I'm gonna direct you to a book called The Talent Code by Daniel Coyle, highly recommend it, check it out. Growth mindset drives motivation, motivation drives achievement. Listen closely here because my perception is that this slide is not common knowledge and in my opinion, it's, it's far from common sense as well. So the stages of motor development. Athletes who are familiar with the stages of motor development not only show less frustration and more acceptance for the flow of process and performance over time, they show more motivation for getting better. Also knowing what stage you're on with a particular skill at any given point in time assists in choosing training activities that are optimal for you. I'm going to provide a brief overview for the characteristics of each stage of motor learning development. As I do so, I want you to think of times when you've experienced being in these stages as an archer athlete. The slow yellow stage. So this is when movements are slow, inconsistent, inefficient, clunky and ugly. Slow yellow requires a ton of thinking. 
You can be in this, this stage as a beginner or even as an elite athlete who's learning a new skill, improving a weakness or refining a skill. Slowing down the movements, isolating the movements, reducing resistance. These are common strategies in the slow yellow stage. Cool blue. Movements become more fluid and reliable in the cool blue stage. And the athlete does not have to use as much complex thought and can, uh, excuse me, can perform with simpler intention. Okay, so there's a difference between thought and intention. Thought's really cognitive heavy and intention is more subtle. More subconscious is used in cool blue compared to slow yellow. And you start to see the correct movement patterns here in slow blue. Clean green stage. Athletes are moving more accurately, efficiently, and fluidly, and you start to see a real balance between the conscious, subconscious, and self-image in the clean green. Now you cannot rest on your laurels once you reach clean green. You constantly cycle through these stages as an athlete as you learn new skills, reach performance plateaus, and strive for better. So you get used to it. You'll always be going through the cycle, just at different uh, levels of proficiency. Once again, research shows that athletes who understand what stage they are in have higher levels of motivation and less frustration. Anecdotally, I believe athletes can experience greater self-empathy for their learning process when they know what stage they're in. Knowing where you are helps you in a way not feel lost. So here's our first reflection. Pause the video and take 60 seconds to reflect on these three questions. Write your answers down on paper. What did you learn? What surprised you? And what excited you? Looking at the title of the slide, let's zoom in on the word effective for a moment. A training, uh, a training activity is only effective if it helps you move towards your goals in some way. In addition, it needs to mesh with your training plan. What might be effective for one person might not be effective for another. When present, inclusion of the elements you see here increase the chances that mental or motor skill acquisition and retention, true learning, will take place. Elements such as clear goals, clear standards, variation over repetition, a scalable challenge, feedback, and reflection. Let's expand on the first element, clear goals. If the activity does not have a clear goal, think twice before you invest your time engaging in that activity. Does the activity help inform and not interrupt your motor skill or mental skill development? As an archer athlete, you are ultimately committed to something called the 4P performance profile. That is, you dedicate your training to developing a consistent process and to move your body in a specific pattern through space to achieve specific positions along the way. Finally, some amount of power and intensity control is required to perform these tasks. So let's use our position would be the uh, achieving of barrel of the gun. You achieve that position by following consistent movement pattern from set to setup for recurve, for recurve bow or from setup to load for compound. Power is the work you must do to open up the bow on your way through the pattern to the position of barrel of the gun. Process includes the mental cues or points of alignment you use to guide your awareness along the way to achieve barrel of the gun. Consider assessing a training activity based on how it's informing your positions, your movement patterns, your mental process, and your power output. You will get more out of a training activity the more awareness and attention you have to what it is informing. Attention is the currency of learning. Standards relate to the goal and define the level of success you're looking to achieve with that goal. They also help to hold the athlete accountable. For example, if the goal of the activity is to improve an athlete's ability to achieve holding, the standard could be achieve holding at least 65 times in the next 72 arrows. That's about 90%. Or let's take the goal of achieving barrel of the gun by the end of setup, recurve, or load compound. The standard might be consciously achieve barrel of the gun at the end of setup or load in 100% of the shots that are executed. To be successful in this training activity, you must consciously achieve barrel of the gun 
before continuing on to the next step in the shot process. If you execute a shot without consciously getting the barrel of the gun, then you are not focused on the goal of that shot. You are lacking attention to what mattered in the moment. Standards are an important structural element of training activities. Look for them. Adjust them to meet your skill level. Create them. Build them into your own training activities. Now, real consequences also help. I'm not talking about punishment here. I'm talking about designing standards that act like prerequisites for moving on to the next level of activity. Now, more about this later. Variation over repetition. Modern research in sports science tells us that athletes benefit from engaging in training activities that are dynamic and varied. Repeating the same drill from the same distance in the same environment with the same equipment can lead to athletes who perform well within a, within a narrow range of circumstances and also bur, uh, risk burnout. Think of that like having, uh, think of performing well in a narrow range of circumstances. Think of that like having a very narrow pencil-like stance in archery, feet maybe even touching uh, down on the ground. That's no good. We want a broader, wider stance to optimize stability. Activities that include variation provide athletes with the experience needed to adapt and problem solve to challenging uh, situations during a competition. Other sports vary their training activities all the time. In archery, however, uh, it's easy to get in, in stuck in a rut. So how can we vary our training activities in archery? Well, the acronym SPEARD provides a quick and easy look at ways we can vary our training activities. Coach Lynn Oberbillig, director of the sports studies, uh, exercise and sports studies graduate program at Smith College and I developed SPEARD together last summer. So let's start with the, the first S, which stands for size and shape of target. So normally, if you use a 122 centimeter face for recurve outdoors, put up an 80 or better yet, put up 180, 160 and 140 all on the same target at whatever distance you need to train at and shoot two arrows into each of those faces during one end. Usually shoot on targets with concentric circles, make targets of different shapes or have, that have different dimensions. The outcome of this is that the mind is forced to function in new ways to problem solve the challenge of hitting a smaller target or a target of a different shape. And it mixes things up, it's fun. That's good for motivation. Physiology is the P. Physiology, what do I mean by that? I want you to get your heart rate up. I want you to tire yourself out before you go shoot your arrows, maybe even before each end. So it's fun, it's great exercise, and also mimics what you will likely feel like in a high pressure situation. I have an activity called the heart rate ladder challenge that I'll share with you later uh, as part of this slideshow. And that's a great example of how you can adjust physiology. So equipment is the E. Always shoot with the same equipment, mix it up. Try a different finger sling. Uh, maybe make it with found objects. Take, it, take the shoelace out of your shoe and make the finger sling out of that shoelace. Try a different bow. Try a different stabilizer setup or uh, take your stabilizer off completely for Olympic and uh, add a long stabilizer for bare bow just to train with. Take your clicker off for Olympic or bare bow, add a clicker. I recognize you can't use a clicker for tournaments in bare bow. But there's no reason you can't use one to help yourself refine the finer movements of expansion for bare bow during training activities. What about A, angle of the target? Shoot uphill, downhill, angle the target left or right. Field archery and 3D archery get this inherently. Though I hear archers in those situations still say that the art, that the target is uh, uh, turned slightly left or right and that bothers them. Get to a point where it doesn't matter your relationship to the target. You can connect with it and you know how to problem solve that situation. Rhythm and rules. Create situations where there's less time to shoot. Shoot to different tempos slow and fast to challenge your intensity control, challenge your attention and focus and your breathing pattern. Change the rules up. Environment, well, shoot at night outside with illuminated targets. Change the indoor lighting. 
If indoors, you could project moving pictures downrange on top of your targets, that's fantastic distraction training. Sound, use sound as a distraction or an enhancer. If it's always dry where you shoot and you know you might be going to a tournament where it uh, could be wet, use a sprinkler to soak your practice session. Uh, rather than standing on stable ground, grab some stability discs or some folded towels and stand on something that challenges your stability. And then the D for, uh, is for distance to target. Change the distance to the target. And maybe shoot two arrows at one distance, two arrows at a second distance, and then two arrows at a third distance before retrieving. So you can combine any number of variables in a single training activity to create novel and varied training activities. That's going to create what we call a deeper schema. You're going to have a broader foundation to draw from uh, when you go perform. That's gonna help you adapt and solve problems uh, in the heat of the moment when things change rapidly in a tournament setting. Uh, you'll be better at that situation. Uh, than your peers who may have not trained in that way. What's most important is remaining grounded in the goals and standards of the activity while using feedback and reflection immediately, consistently, and honestly. So in other words, just because we change the size of the target or change up the rules for a game does not mean the focus of completing follow through with the most amount of back tension can be tossed under the rug, for example. A scalable challenge. Become a master of your universe by scaling and adapting a training activity until it feels like an optimal level of challenge for you. It is important to note that sometimes it's not the activity that needs to be scaled, it's the equipment. Activities focused on barrel of the gun are only helpful if you can actually achieve barrel of the gun. So, for example, your compound bow would need to be set at the correct draw length. And for recurve, your draw weight would need to be at a level where you can actually find barrel of the gun during setup. In other words, your equipment needs to actually allow you to achieve the patterns, positions, power, and process that you're striving to improve. Now, I wanna say a little more about challenge here because it's an important message. Training activities should always be challenging. Sure, some can be fun too, but challenging always. Scale an activity up or down until you are at the crispy edge of your growth zone, where success is not guaranteed if you slack off. Train at the crispy edge of challenge. And here's what I mean by the crispy edge of challenge right here. Take a look at this concentric circle sketch that I've drawn. The green area represents your comfort zone. The yellow, your growth zone, where you might start to have a little bit of butterflies in your, in your uh, tummy and uh, the red is your danger zone. That danger zone is where the challenge is too great for your current mental or physical skill level. The white arrow points to the crispy edge. That's the fine line but, uh, between still being in the growth zone yet feeling the heat from the fire in the danger zone. Training on the crispy edge, size and span of your comfort zone. There is one fundamental truth about any sort of practice. If you never push yourself beyond your comfort zone, you will never improve. In a wide variety of human activity, achievement is not possible without discomfort. Think about those quotes and ask yourself, do you step outside your comfort zone when you're training or do you stay in your comfort zone? And hopefully by the end of the night tonight, you'll be able to uh, identify specifically what you can do to help you step out of your comfort zone and find that crispy edge during your training. So let's revisit real, real consequences while exploring the importance of feedback and training activities. The spirit of what I mean by real consequences is highlighted really well. It's highlighted beautifully by Daniel Coyle, author of The Talent Code. I mentioned him earlier, um, and he made some observations about skateboarders. Quote, you've seen it happen. You hand a kid a skateboard, they start messing around, and before you know it, without any coaches, instruction books, or classroom, they are crazily, stupidly, mythically skilled. The question is, why? And the answer is feedback. 
Skateboarders learn incredibly quickly because they receive a rich, continuous, useful stream of high quality feedback. Every action creates an immediate and crystal clear consequence. Mistakes can be detected, patterns intuited, brain circuitry swiftly built, end quote. So in a way, archers do not have it as easy as skateboarders. And you're wondering how so? Well, a skateboarder has immediate negative consequences for ineffective patterns, wrong positions and misplaced power. That is, they fall and skin meets pavement. Uh, in contrast, when an archer is inefficient with patterns, positions, power, and process, the archer still gets to shoot an arrow and hear the satisfying thwack downrange. The potential for musculoskeletal injuries in archery are just really not part of the equation. In a way, we are plagued by the joy of launching arrows. That is, as archers, we might risk poor shots too frequently because the feedback we get is not strong enough to really snap us out of the joy we find in sending arrows downrange. What would happen to a skateboarder if they engaged in the feedback process with a cavalier disposition? How would your focus and attention to feedback be different? And how carefully would you shoot your next arrow? If you convinced yourself that you were taking the same risk as a skateboarder who was going off a jump, it's so easy in archery to get lost inside of training activities and lose sight of what the purpose of the activity is. Feedback is the remedy. Timely, vivid, accurate feedback. There's two different types of feedback, sensory and augmented. Let's call it augmented feedback, external feedback. So sensory and external. You can think of it as internal and external. Sensory feedback could be watching a real-time video of yourself. So you're performing the, your movements here and there's a video camera that's recording you and it's, it's getting live streamed directly to a big monitor in front of yourself. This is great for overhead views to help you see if you're getting to barrel of the gun. Um, using a mirror would be an uh, example of sensory feedback or simply feeling the shot and comparing those feelings and sensations to what you know a good shot feels like. Right? That's also sensory feedback, but you need to know what a good shot feels like. External feedback could be the form of a coach or communicating with you or from a delayed video uh, playback app. So for delayed video playback app, you can set these up on a tripod with a, say a tablet on a tripod and the app allows you to record your shot. And then by the time you walk around and watch it, it's playing, so it automatically kind of loops back through. So videodelay.com is one option, check it out. Training activities need to include an element of feedback. They have to, and they have, and the feedback must be internalized by the athlete, by you in a meaningful way in order to become crazily, stupidly, mythically skilled, to quote Daniel Coyle. Now, what about reflection? So reflection is a tool we use to help bridge the gap between motor performance, those were short learning, those were skills that stick over time. Begin to answer this question during reflection. Did the training activity work? That is, did it move you towards understanding and executing your process, power, position, and movement pattern in more effective ways? Ultimately, this is the measure of what makes a training activity effective. Did it work for you? James Clear, author of Atomic Habits said, and I've altered this quote a little while still retaining its meaning, quote, we often lie to ourselves about the progress we are making on important goals. For example, if we want to get stronger, we might claim that we're working out, but in reality, our exercise habits haven't changed very much. If we want to learn a new language, we might say that we've been consistent with our practice even though we skipped last night and watched television. We use lukewarm phrases like, I'm doing well with the time that I have available, or I've been trying really hard recently. Rarely do these statements include any type of hard measurement. They are usually just soft excuses that make us feel better about having a goal that we haven't made much real progress toward, all right? To continue with this quote, why do these little lies matter? Because they are preventing us from self-awareness. Emotions and feelings are important and they have a place. But when we use feel-good statements to track our progress in life, 
we end up lying to ourselves about what, we, about what we're actually doing. When the stethoscope came along, it provided a tool for physicians to get an independent diagnosis of what was go going on inside of a patient. We can also use tools to get an independent diagnosis of what is going on inside of our own lives, end quote. So the practice of reflection is one of those tools. It requires attention and engagement during and after the training activity. Reflection and debriefing can help bridge the gap between motor performance, short-term goals, and motor learning skills at stick. I encourage you to take note of these last two slides, the feedback uh, and the importance of feedback and reflection in developing mythical skills that stick over time. What format can reflection take during a training activity? Well, they could be as formal as writing in a journal or writing in, or uh, as anything as formal as writing in a journal or writing an integrity report. Exercises certainly take, uh, like that certainly take more commitment. They could also be more informal, something like having a conversation with your coach as you retrieve arrows. Both require active engagement by the athlete in order to be effective. So journaling, what can you journal about? Your coach could ask you questions or you could design your own questions. But what questions should you be ask, asking yourself or what questions should you be asked? Open-ended questions that relate back to the goals and standards of the activity, I find always work best. So in other words, you don't want questions that just would end in a yes or a no. You want questions that start out with um, things like, how did you, or describe, or share. Uh, so like, describe what it feels like when you reach the end of follow through now compared to before the activity, or how successful were you in meeting the standard for this activity and why. Explain how and why your movements during setup are more optimal now compared to old, older movement patterns. So those are a few examples. Uh, what about integrity? An integrity, integrity report. So an integrity report, think of it like a line in the sand. Now, I will write a weekly integrity report on Saturdays at 4 p.m. Or maybe you, you will write, let's call an IR every other week, or maybe once a month. In my IR, I will provide evidence that my training had a positive impact. Consider adjusting the training plan or your training activities if you cannot see evidence of improvement. You can use the six elements of goals, standards, variability, scalability, feedback, and reflection to assess if an activity is good for you. What goals does it move you towards? Are the standards clear? Is it varied and fun? Can you scale the activity to an appropriate level of challenge for you? How useful is the feedback? And what did you learn? Let's move on to performance under pressure before we have another reflection session. Training activities are also used to help athletes simulate pressure situations or simply mimic tournament conditions of any kind. Athletes do not want to be relaxed. We need tension to perform, right? We need an optimal level of tension. People frequently ask me, coach, what can I do to perform better under pressure? And the answer really depends on what stimulates the feeling of pressure in the athlete asking the question. Training activities that help you perform better under pressure are those activities that simulate the types of situations which evoke the experience of pressure or anxiety in you, right? This is athlete dependent. To move forward with this conversation, you need to use insight and honestly identify what situations that you can foresee have happening or maybe have happened that stimulate unproductive levels of stress physically and mentally in you during training or competition situations. Think of those anxieties, those, um, those unproductive or unhealthy levels of stress as small holes in the hull of your boat and you are the captain of your boat. Well, boat captains find, find hole in their hulls all the time. And they just fix them before heading back out to sea. They take time to take their boat and dry dock it and fix the holes. Similarly, you are best served by identifying the holes in your hull, your weaknesses, 
and working on exploring the nature of those holes rather than ignoring them. Some portion of the training activities you choose or design should target the holes in your hull and make you more seaworthy, more tournament ready. Training activities that help, in, um, help you perform better under pressure simulate those situations that would generate negative stress for you in a tournament situation. And doing this in training session, session allows you the space and time to, uh, number one, identify what you have control over, B, it helps you identify how to problem solve and adapt in order to three, excel in the face of adversity. And that's what we're really trying to do here is have you problem solve how you can excel in the face of that particular adversity. So here's our second, here's your second reflection prompt. Pause the video and take 60 seconds to reflect on these three questions. Write your answers down on your paper because that's going to help bridge um, this from an experience that you just experienced to something where you take away long-term understanding and knowledge. So what did you learn? What surprised you and what excited you? You're about to see two short videos. I'm really excited to, to show you. So in the videos, there's a short progression of training activities related to posture and core alignment. Both videos are small portions of much longer videos designed to guide athletes through two full training sessions. Since the sections we're watching are small parts of the whole, there may be a few spots <clears throat> where you will need to infer context. Uh, I don't believe this will undermine your learning about training activities in any way. You're always welcome to go back and watch the entire video after tonight. I, I will provide the links for you. I created the activities that you're about to see. Um, I created the activities at the beginning of the progression with the assumption that the viewer is in the slow yellow stage of motor development in relation to their ability to establish and maintain optimal posture and core alignment. The activities build, as you'll see, in challenge level from what would be appropriate for slow yellow stage through the cool blue stage. The final few activities in the second video would even be appropriate for someone uh, in the clean green stage of motor development for managing core alignment during the shot cycle. As you watch the videos, be looking for key elements like goals, standards, variability, scalability, methods of feedback, and reflection prompts. Here we go. Step one of the crush the towel progression starts with you laying on the ground with your feet flat on the ground, knees bent. Place one hand under your lumbar spine area, your lower back, and feel that hollow that is present. You should be able to slide your hand into the hollow area pretty easily. Now, take a lightweight towel or t-shirt and loosely manipulate it into a long section of fabric. Do not roll it. The roll will become too thick and hard for you to do this activity. Thread the fabric underneath through the hollow of your lower back so that you have equal lengths of towel extending to the left and right sides of your body. Grab either side of that towel and work with a partner or solo and floss the towel back and forth through that hollow a few times just to give you a sensation that that towel can move freely through that hollow space. Now, take a deep inhale as you would in set position as you're lying there on the ground and allow the exhale to facilitate your pushing the sticker that's on your lower back through the towel to try to get the sticker to touch the floor. As long as you are pushing the sticker to the floor, the towel should be impossible to slide back and forth now. You're crushing the towel, all right? This is where the, the activity gets its name, crush the towel. Push the sticker to the, to the floor for eight full seconds, holding that contraction before resting for eight full seconds. During those eight seconds of contraction, breathe with the diaphragm, not from the chest. We want to mimic proper breathing mechanics during this trill. 
As you crush the towel, you should feel your glutes and abs, your core, engage firmly. Imprint what this feels like because you'll need to replicate this sensation in the next portion, uh, the next step of this activity when we stand up. Repeat this cycle of crushing the towel and then relaxing for eight seconds on, eight seconds off, five times. Step two of crush the towel, stand up and place your back against a wall. Your heels will be out away from the base of the wall by a few inches. Find the hollow behind your back with your hands and then thread the towel through the hollow with equal parts sticking on the left, sticking out on the left and right sides of your, of your body. Just like we just did on the floor, but now you're standing up. Again, inhale deeply and as you deflate through the front of your torso, exhale, push the sticker through the towel to the wall. Hold that contraction for eight seconds and then relax. Repeat that cycle five times, making sure you apply the exhale to initiate the crushing of the towel and then continue to breathe with the diaphragm throughout the eight seconds. An important note is that you're going to feel your shoulders and head come off the wall and round forward as you crush the towel, as you push the sticker through the towel to the wall. Allow that to happen. Allow your head and shoulders to come for forward naturally off the wall as you uh, crush that towel. All right. Take time to imprint what this movement feels like because you're going to need to be really proficient at that and holding that contraction as we move on to the next step of this progression. Step three of crush the towel, grab a stretch band and a mirror and you're going to apply the shot cycle using an open stance with a band facing the mirror. Use the breath cycle during set to facilitate finding proper posture. And you're gonna do five minutes of focus. So deep practice for five minutes where you are tuning in deeply to what the movements feel like when you are following the crush the towel cue correctly. Imprint these movements and feelings during these five minutes so that you're ready to move on to the next phase. Now here's the standard that I want you to apply to this particular uh, step in the crush the towel progression. If you see your chest rising or the hollow of your back form, all right, during any, uh, any portion of these five minutes, stop and slow down the movements until you're successful, until you've uh, successfully locked that chest back down and tucked that pelvis back under. You'll need a bow and a mirror for step four of crush the towel. We'll be applying your new awareness of posture now to finally using a bow, but in front of a mirror, no arrows. Remember to use the breath during set to facilitate finding that initial finding of proper posture. And you'll be doing this for five minutes because it's again, five minutes of focus where you engage in deep practice. I want you to imprint these movements and feelings, and that's going to take attention and focus. You need to have deep practice here. Standards. If you see your chest rise or the hollow form in your, in your lower back, stop, slow the movements down, and go back to an earlier part of the shot cycle or to the stretch band or the wall or floor if you need to revisit what the proper movements feel like. Allow yourself to keep going if you're not being successful time and time and time again. Describe your experience feeling proper posture. How would you describe it? And two, when you're correctly crushing the towel during set position, and then you go into set up, how does the raising of the bow feel different? Part two of your training sessions today is called Foundations. The format is going to be MDESA 6, and I think this is going to take you about 45 to 60 minutes. So MDESA stands for multiple distance, every second arrow, and the six indicates the total number of arrows that you're going to shoot in an end. MDESA six therefore communicates that you will shoot two arrows at one distance, move, shoot two arrows at a second distance, move, and shoot your final two arrows at a third distance before you go ahead and retrieve. Do this for 45 to 60 minutes, focused on two specific goals. One, Achieve the same stance each time you move your feet. Use a paw pad if you want to be sure. Two, achieve proper posture in set position and then maintain that posture, that flat profile with your back 
weight towards the balls of the feet in every single shot. The assessment tool you'll use to help measure your progress in this particular progression is one of my favorites. And I call it get the point. So you'll need two small containers. One, uh, one of the containers will be full of small objects. Maybe they're knocks, points, cute little rocks, cranberries, um, marbles. Uh, you get the point. We are going to be using, in this case, actual target points right here. And so this container is filled with 50 to 100 points. And then this container is empty. So after every two shots, assess your performance with posture, and then walk over to where these are. So I'm going to put these on a table near the shooting line. You'll walk over to the table. And if you performed two shots where you know your posture was spot on, you know it was, well, then you take two points and you put it here. And then you go shoot two more arrows. And then maybe out of those two arrows, only one of them had proper posture, and the other one you could feel your chest rise. Well, then come back over after shooting those two arrows and take out one point and add it here. All right? And then go shoot your final two arrows before retrieving. And maybe on that one, maybe you uh, also shot two arrows with perfect posture. And you could feel. Okay, so that is the first video, and then the progression continues. Here, let me just cue it up for you. Part one of today's training circuit is banded mo. That's mirror on wall, and the cue is going to be crush the tower. Well, actually, let's just uh, let's go back that. here for one moment. I'll just pause it here. If you take a look at this picture here, this is a picture that I took of a, a beginning archer. And this is what they looked like on the left, uh, clearly of a hollow back, uh, poor core alignment. Um, uh, and we did the crush the towel drill and progression uh, very quickly right there, uh, basically during one end. And then on his next shot, he went to the line. And this is typically what we see from this progression. You can see the much flatter back profile uh, from uh, the hips up through the back over the shoulders. Part one of today's training circuit is banded mo. That's mirror on wall. And the cue is going to be crush the towel. Place a long mirror at torso height and use a stretch band and shoot towards the mirror as if it were the target. The time at the mirror is time for you to get visual feedback and imprint proper core alignment when you are making the proper movement patterns. I want 100% of the six shot cycle reps completed while at the mirror to have perfect core alignment. Use your breath and the crush the towel cue during set position to initiate proper posture. Part two of today's circuit is dirty laundry and the cue you'll use is crush the towel. Dirty laundry challenges your ability to maintain posture and head position in the horizontal and vertical planes by giving you immediate feedback about how stable your foundation is. Here's how the equivalent of a clothesline across the width of the range. And off of that clothesline, I've dangled a few lengths of cordage that are maybe two to three feet long. Slide one of those short lengths of cordage that are dangling down, slide it to the left or right, until when you're standing at your spot in the line, and I want that piece of cordage that's dangling to bisect the target face that you're shooting behind it. Now, the piece of cordage that's dangling down, I want that to be at least 10 feet in front of your target. If it's right up against the target, uh, this activity won't work. Because the dangling cord is between you and the target, if you move it all in the vertical plane or in the horizontal plane, visually it's going to look like the target and the, the cordage are moving back and forth in front of each other. So that's how you're going to get immediate feedback with this particular exercise. If you manage intensity control of core alignment well and head position remains steady, the string and tape 
will re visually remain in the same relationship to the target from set position all the way through follow through. Two goals that I want you to have for dirty laundry. One, use the first part of the breath cycle to help establish proper core alignment during set position. Two, shoot six arrows in a row and have the dangling cord stay visually stable in relation to the background on 90% of the shots. Part three of this circuit is called Richter scale and the cue you will use is still crush the towel. Richter scale is simply a variation of a theme on dirty laundry. The only difference is that you're going to be standing on two stability discs while you do this. If the two stability discs feel like too much of a challenge, you could use a balance board like we, the one we have at the archery range, or if you don't have that or want, um, want even less risk, go ahead and fold several towels up into long rectangles and then place them on top of each other so you have maybe something that stands about yay high. Goals for Richter scale, number one, use the first first part of the breath cycle to help establish proper core alignment in set position. And number two, shoot six arrows in a row and have the dangling cord stay visually stable in relation to the background on 90% of the shots. Now that you understand how dirty laundry and Richter scale work, let me give you an overview again of this particular circuit. You'll start out with a banded mo mirror on wall, six reps of the shot cycle with a stretch band. Second, Dirty laundry, you'll need your vertical dangling cord set up in the right spot, and you're trying to go through your shot cycle maintaining proper core alignment without having that cordage move at all visually. Six arrows. Third, Richter scale, it's the same as dirty laundry except you're standing on two stability discs. Six arrows. After you've done dirty laundry and Richter scale, go ahead and retrieve all 12 arrows and then repeat and wrap as many rounds as possible for 45 minutes. In short, it will look like six shot cycle repetitions in front of a mirror with a stretch band. Moving on to dirty laundry, six arrows, Richter scale, six arrows, and then retrieve. Describe the process you go through to find proper core alignment in set position. Where in your shot cycle did the dangling string used in Dirty Laundry and Richter Scale reveal you had head or core movement? On the shots that you made where the dangling string in Dirty Laundry or Richter Scale stayed totally steady, how did those shots feel and what were you doing differently to achieve that success? Thank you so much everybody for watching. Okay, so last few slides here um, go over uh, the 22 activities that I promised you to walk away with this evening. So hopefully you were able to identify in, and, and then observe key elements like goals, standards, variability and scalability, methods of feedback and reflection prompts in action during those two videos. The next several slides um, provide direct links for the 22 videos or posts on the Sattva blog that contain training activity outlines, uh, examples and resources. The links on titled Hollaback 1 or Hollaback 2 go to the full versions of the training session videos you just saw small parts of. Uh, the, bottom, the uh, bottom link for draw side elbow is for Olympic and barebow. And that has training activities to help athletes get their draw side elbow in line with or just inside of the arrow line, starting at set position and maintaining that alignment throughout the rest of the shot. Three of these videos explore breathing, intensity control, and rhythm. They build upon each other in order in which they're listed here. Each video contains multiple training activities designed to move the athlete towards the goal of the training session. Clear goals, clear standards, cues, methods of feedback, reflection questions, it's all there for you. Please note though, on the first two videos, I'm updating those because I can now see where I can do a better job as a coach communicating the breathing pattern 
So the links for those two might change, but the, the breathing pattern on the third one, um, I'm a lot happier with how I communicated it. So if there's any questions, see the third one, uh, the, there's a short section where I review the breathing cycle. Uh, setup number one and setup number two have a, a, a host of training activities ideal for Olympic and bareboat athletes who want to learn the dynamic and angular movements of setup in NTS. Now, not only are there uh, great activities, the entire intro of these videos help, have helpful graphics and demonstrations, uh, descriptions, cues, methods of feedback, and reflection questions. The rainbow zones challenges on, on this particular slide, we've got snakes and scorpions, rainbow zones, rainbow zones plus snakes and scorpions, um, and a few others. So let me go over three of them. Rainbow zones challenges athletes to focus on consistent, strong follow through, and uh, it provides you delayed feedback uh, in relation to where the draw arm ends up in space at the end of follow through from shot to shot. This activity could also be modified to provide feedback on the bow side as well by simply adding another rainbow stick to the activity. You're probably like, what is a rainbow stick? Uh, watch the video, you'll find out. On thin ice, this, uh, this activity transforms the archer's disc into a thin sheet of ice with two treasure chests on it. So bow side and draw side. And you are a pirate that need to capture those two treasure chests. You must, must reach your treasure feeling stronger and more connected than ever before, because we all know what happens to pirates who show up to a treasure feeling weak and relaxed and cavalier. Spoiler alert, they are outsmarted by an opposing pirate who cared more about getting the treasure and uh, bad things happen. So get to the treasures feeling strong. In order to stay on top of the ice and not fall through, tension and direction must be maintained during follow through. Uh, the last activity, One Way Street, uses a clicker in an unconventional way to gauge the consistency of your intensity control throughout the shot cycle. The clicker provides a sensory feedback that is immediate, vivid, and honest. I highly recommend this for barebow as well. Again, I said it earlier, but just because clickers are not allowed in competition for barebow does not mean you can't use them as training aids to learn about intensity control or the finer internal and invisible aspects of expansion. The bracelet challenge is a post on my blog that was part of an online archery carnival we started uh, about a year ago. The goal to learn through experience how changing brace height will impact equipment performance and to be able to answer the question, what brace height seems to feel best for me? This activity was designed for people uh, as an exercise in understanding brace height that could be, and an exercise that could be completed independently of their bow being tuned or not. So you could also do this activity actually as part of the tuning process. And if you did that, I would encourage you to have the other variables of your tune in place first. So limb alignment, center shot, draw weight, tiller, et cetera. Those would need to be done first before you go explore brace height. In addition, rather than using the recording resource that I have on my blog for taking notes on how it feels at different, uh, different numbers of twists in your string, use this uh, uh, plotting chart on the screen in front of you uh, to, to map out uh, the groupings of your arrows and how the groupings uh, the, how the cluster changes in size at different brace heights, okay? Contact me if you have any questions about this one. I, I love this activity. Um, and that was a, a brief description. So if you wanna do this as part of your tuning, let me know, contact me. Champs is one of my favorite activities and I'm gonna go over that on the next, in a few slides from now. All the other activities on this slide are on the Sattva blog and have clear goals as well as clear skill and knowledge outcomes. So let's look at the heart rate, rate challenge right now. And here's, you can see on the slide, what I mean by a skill and knowledge outcomes, all right, for the heart rate ladder challenge. So get your heart rate up to 100 before you go shoot one end, 
then go get your heart rate up to 120 before you shoot and number two, 140 beats per minute before you shoot number uh, and number three, get them up to get your heart up to 160 beats per minute before uh, and number four, and then work your way back down this ladder. All the heart rate values are based off the highest heart rate um, at the top of the ladder there. And you can calculate that by taking 220 minus your age and then subtract 10 off of that and use that as the top of your ladder. Um, how do you get your heart rate up? Well, it's totally your choice. You could do butt kicks, you could do high knees, you get on a treadmill, stationary bike, sit ups, air squats, box jumps, pull ups, push ups, weighted squats, air squats, uh, power lifting, get creative and do what challenges you, but also do what excites you as well. Uh, it helps to have a heart rate monitor for this. CHAMP is completely scalable and requires a little bit of research on behalf of the coach or the athlete. So the values used in CHAMP that you see here in the, in the row that's, that's labeled CHAMP are actual scores achieved by an actual person who achieved a rank that you want to strive to achieve. Uh, CHAMP can be completed by round or end. This example shows round and the next slide shows end. This example shows CHAMP as the first place recurve cadet male 2019 outdoor nationals, North Carolina. The trick to CHAMP is the actual choosing of the CHAMP. You wanna make the activity challenging yet still feel like you accomplished something. Notice Taylor's scores. Taylor did not beat CHAMP at all. And in this case, I would recommend choosing a CHAMP that shot closer to 300 since Taylor shot at 293. And if the activity does not feel achievable, it needs to be scaled so that you feel like you're the master of your world again. Don't complain, just scale it or do it. So this version of CHAMP is by arrow value uh, of the first end as shot by the 10th place recurve cadet male 2019 uh, North Carolina outdoors. Notice Wanda scores. Wanda has the opposite issue of Taylor. Wanda needs, first of all, to take time and celebrate because she, she shot well. And then second, choose an athlete that has a higher ranking than this champ in order to live on the crispy edge, all right? So hopefully those last two slides show you examples of, um, you know, when you need to adjust, scale the challenge to stay on the crispy edge uh, and when you need to scale the challenge to remain the master of your archery world. Quick summary of what we covered tonight. You want to adapt activities until you feel like a superhero and like you're the master of your universe. Superheroes don't have it easy. We regularly watch them get the stuffing kicked out of them and we see them bounce back. They're resilient in the face of adversity and they finish strong. Some portion of the training activities you, you do should be like that. Train on the crispy edge. Challenge is the prerequisite for growth. Number four. Identify what stresses you out and create training activities that simulate those situations. In time, your stressors, stress, stressors will move from the danger zone into the growth zone and eventually your comfort zone. Number five, choose activities that inform learning rather than interrupt learning. Six, feedback is vital to developing mythical skills. Vivid, immediate, honest feedback. <laughs> as long as you have an accurate representation of what it is you're trying to accomplish. Reflection. Reflection demands active participation, which demands attention and awareness. Attention makes skills stick long-term. Slow yellow, cool blue, clean green. Know your stages to increase your motivation and so you don't feel like you get lost along the way. So we have two more slides that will guide you through your final request, uh, reflection questions tonight. And this question is, so what does this all mean? So what? And the question is, how did this experience impact you? How did it inform your practice? So I want you to pause the video here, take 60 seconds and reflect on this prompt. How did this experience impact you? How did it how did it inform your practice? Final prompt of the evening, now what? How will you apply what you have learned to your training?
training practice. So go ahead, take 60 seconds and write down that answer. Uh, along with this video, I've put together a PDF of that includes links to all of the different 22 training activities and my contact is on there as well. Please reach out if you have uh, any questions at all and uh, or have your own ideas for training activities that you get excited about. Thank you everybody for joining me and for watching this video. If you have feedback, please uh, send me an email or call me. I'd love to hear from you. Take care.